Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Prepping poll installment number three. The question was, World War III is on its way. A genie presents himself and says, you can only choose one of these Super Prepper holdouts. Which would it be? These were the five options. One, a huge solar powered yacht in the Atlantic with a desalination system and a 50 caliber machine gun with an undisclosed amount of ammunition. So a lot of ammo, most likely. Or, number two, a castle in the woods in the Canadian Boreal Forest. Sounds very appealing, if you're Canadian especially. Number three, a self-sufficient, small, isolated island in the Caribbean. That sounds very appealing to even us Canadians. Number four, a 2,000 square foot bunker with three years worth of supplies in the Arizona de desert. I have a feeling that that one's going to appeal to the all-American prepper. Number five is going to be a farm in New Zealand with 100 sheep and Mark Zuckerberg as your neighbor. So let's see what you guys said in this poll. Stay tuned. This video was brought to you in part by Silky Saws, the sharpest, fastest cutting and most capable saws for survivalists, bushcrafters and preppers. Go check them out on CanadianPreparedness.com. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified when new videos are posted. Enjoy the video. So the number one response was self-sufficient isolated island in the Caribbean at 37%. Second was a Canadian boreal forest at 24%. Third was a 2,000 square foot bunker, 17%. Number four, which was surprising to me, was a uh, farm in New Zealand with Mark Zuckerberg as your neighbor. And number five, a huge solar powered yacht with desalination and a 50 cal coming in at 9%. So the point of a poll like this, obviously it's one part entertainment, but it's also infotainment because it allows us to discuss uh, the strategic placement, our location in a crap hits the fan situation. What would be ideal? And I carefully crafted this poll so that all of the options had pros and cons. And it's not really hard to do that because no matter where you are in the world, unless you're in a complete fortified paradise there's always going to be pros and cons in the desert there's no water but there's a lot of heat and there's not many people in the forest there's a lot of resources but it's very cold etc so i'm going to quickly go over uh, before we talk about your comments i'm going to provide you the rationale for each one of these options and what the pros and cons were from my perspective so in the first condition a huge solar powered yacht with desalination 50 cal what you have there is mobility you have a nomadic lifestyle you have a yacht which can potentially be powered so long as your solar system functions which is potentially decades you have a desalination system which so long as that doesn't break down you have an indefinite source of water and of course you have a pretty good self-defense system but of course there are cons to that as well number one uh, you can never form a sedentary lifestyle in that you can never uh, partake in uh, larger scale horticulture. Perhaps you could grow a few things on board, but it probably wouldn't be a very efficient use of your space. Uh, you're also a sitting duck for pirates. And then even if you have that mounted 50 caliber uh, weapon, that's probably not going to be enough to uh, stave off attacks forever. You're probably going to come across some sort of gang of, you know, post collapse uh, nautical misfits that are going to overthrow you the benefit of being in a yacht is that you have that nomadic aspect so this actually is probably one of the least isolated of all of these conditions because you can go from place to place uh, that opens up the opportunity for trade and things of that nature uh, number two was a castle in the woods so one of the main benefits of course is the seclusion factor Another benefit is that there's going to be an abundance of wild game. Fishing, hunting, trapping. Chances are you're not going to run out of food so long as you don't have too many people staying with you in that castle. Because the land can only support so many people. You may be able to partake in some small scale uh, agriculture. But remember the growing season in Canada is very short. So you get about three, maybe four months, uh, five months tops in the best of conditions to get your crops in the ground and harvest them. Now, one of the biggest drawbacks, should you go without saying at this point, it's the cold weather that's gonna kill you. In order to heat that castle, it's gonna take a lot of wood. It's gonna take a whole lot of work and a whole lot of silky saws. Um, speaking of which, I just wanna quickly 
uh, a message from our sponsor, which is myself, because I'm selling this at the store now. This is the new version of the Silky Pocket Boy. Take a look at that sucker. It's a beauty. Let me get it to focus here. There we go. It's a beauty, man. And this thing is going to be with you a lifetime. And one of the reasons why, I mean, all silky saws are going to last you a lifetime. But this one in particular, because the the blade is so short, uh, even the biggest of noobs who break silky saws, I've never broken one. Apparently a few people have because they're trying to use it like a buck saw. And speaking of which, uh, I got a message for Wrangle Star. I'm gonna have to make a response video to some of the videos he's been making lately that have been uh, misrepresenting the silky saws. He's done uh, a couple of really silly comparison videos. And as much as I like Wrangle Star, I gotta say that the guy doesn't know anything about these kind of saws. And I'm going to break it all down in an upcoming video. So stay tuned for that. So this thing is 130 millimeters very small very compact you can cut a log which is the length of this with relative ease and uh, because of the curved factor it's going to cut a lot faster because remember it's those teeth are making contact with the wood throughout the whole entirety of the cut there's nothing going on like this where you're you're cutting with a straight blade so this thing is the bomb man uh, $40 Canadian on the Canadian Preparedness website, which translates into about 30 bucks USD. Anyways, getting back to this survey. So, number three, which was the most popular of the results. And I'm going to talk about the results in a bit. But a self-sufficient small isolated island in the Caribbean. So, number the, the number one benefit of this, obviously, is going to be the temperature. You're going to be able to survive year-round. You're going to have a long growing season. You're going to be able to grow all kinds of stuff down there anything you could probably imagine is going to grow particularly fruits you're going to be able to fish so your food's going to be taken care of uh the number one weaknesses of this position is going to be uh, being able to defend an island if it ever was stumbled upon by some pirates the isolation factor could psychologically uh, be a problem and all of these have an element of isolation to them of course with the exception of the last one but most of these uh, places that i'm talking about here it's you and maybe a few people and that's something which you shouldn't overlook because of the reason why people don't like the hole in prison and would prefer to be out in the yard taking their chances with the big boys because it's psychologically hell to just be by yourself for the rest of your existence even if you are with a few people eventually you're gonna want to meet more people so the isolation factor is a big one another negative factor is gonna be the storms the Atlantic storms tropical storms hurricanes so there's probably always gonna be a cave that you can take refuge in but uh, by and large you know if you do create some elaborate structure at some point, it's going to be blown down by a massive hurricane. Number four was a 2,000 square foot bunker with three years of supplies in the Arizona desert. Now, the benefits of this one above all the other ones, all of the other conditions are going to involve a lot of work, a lot of very hard work. You're going to be out there toiling in the soil. You're going to be fishing all day. You're going to be chopping wood all day. You're going to be doing something in each one of those other situations. But three years worth of supplies... You know, I use the analogy of uh, all the energy on Earth coming from the sun and that the oil that's in the ground, that's the result of the sun's energy batting down on the planet for the last millions and millions of years, fueling life on the planet. Now, all that energy has been stored in a concentrated form in this uh, black gold, as we call it, and which to some people is actually going to be black bile, the black bile of the Earth per se. In the same way that the sun moves the tides, it moves the air, it provides the solar radiation, it provides us energy. Three years worth of supplies is three years worth of stored energy. That means that's energy you don't have to use in order to subsist, in order to keep yourself alive. All you have to do is eat, sleep, and crap. That's basically all you have to do. For three years, that's a long time. And maybe if you ration your supplies, you might get a little bit more out of that but the downsides of course is that one you're stuck in the arizona desert depending on how far in how far you are from a, a body of water you're gonna be potentially landlocked 
in that regard. And the other downside of this existence is a sedentary existence. You're going to have to have some sort of exercise. At some point, you're going to be wanting to pop your head out above ground. And because one of the reasons why, and I'm going to make a video specifically on this factor alone, is that one of the benefits of being nomadic as opposed to sedentary is just, I mean, look at the comparisons of an egalitarian a hunter-gatherer who's lean, uh, they're fit, compared to a sedentary slob of modern society who just sits there all day on, on a chair and, you know, consumes and consumes. So three years into the post-apocalyptic landscape, you begin to emerge more and more into the dark world uh, as this person who's been sedentary for the last three years. You're soft, you are totally out of shape, and you're going up against people who've been hardened to the elements for the last three years. People who have been out there uh, fighting to survive, people who still have their wits about them, and probably people who aren't making best friends with their many different personalities they've acquired by dissociating while in isolation. So something to keep in mind. There's pros and cons to each one of these scenarios. Now, number five was kind of a comical one, but it was also very serious. And it's actually probably one among the most serious because this is where a lot of the so-called Silicon Valley elites are investing in is New Zealand. And there's reasons why, which we'll get into, but a farmland in New Zealand with 100 sheep, Mark Zuckerberg as your neighbor. Now, this is probably one of the least isolated of options, meaning that it's isolated geographically from the rest of the world, but there's probably going to be a lot of the people in New Zealand, of course. It's a, it's a country, so there's a lot of people there. The number one benefits within a World War III scenario is that a lot of the radiation from the fallout and the, uh, the uh, nuclear power plants not being properly shut down and no longer able to cool the nuclear waste and all of that stuff going into the air and circulating uh, about the northern hemisphere there's not a whole lot of nuclear power plants in the southern hemisphere there's not a lot of nuclear targets in a world war three scenario in the southern atmosphere aside some of the equatorial countries uh, you have maybe uh, some parts of south africa uh, some parts of south america some larger cities down there but most of those two are, are closer to the equator than really south new zealand and australia they kind of stand alone and uh, for the most part, uh, New Zealand, as far as I know, is, is quite the neutral country when it comes to global conflict. That's going to be some of the benefits. And of course, having the farmland, having the sheep, uh, being out of the way of the blast zone. So I responded to a few of these comments, but I'm going to read them to you. So uh, number one here, this is by Mr. Migido. I'm in New Zealand. I have 300 sheep as well as several hundred rams to do Zuck what he's been doing to us for years. Yeah, that, that's funny. You know, I did laugh my ass off when I first read that comment. But the more I think about it, you know, you do that to yourself. You know, you put yourself out there on Facebook. Nobody held a gun to your head and said, hey, you got to go on Facebook and put all of your information on there. Like nobody told me I have to come on YouTube and basically put my entire life on here for the world to see. That's my choice. Personal responsibility, buddy. Anyways, I appreciate your comment. Huge solar powered yacht in the Atlantic with desalination. Desire to own 50 cal overrides all rational thought. This has to be a very close relative of our main man, all American prepper, which I guarantee you is going to be making an appearance this summer. So stay tuned for that. A castle in the woods, a vote for that one by Brian Pint, probably the most secluded. Uh, island could get overran by one military or another marking bases. Absolutely. I never thought about that. A 50 won't help you too much with a Navy ship. I agree. Sheep are loud and Zuck will watch my every move and there's no patience for that. That's true. He'll probably find some way to craft some post-apocalyptic surveillance grid, uh, knowing that guy. Plus, if you got people with you, which I probably won't, the castle has a lot of room. Yeah, so it's probably too much room to heat just for one person maybe that's what you're implying uh my response to that was the cold the cold is probably going to to kill you but if you yeah if you have a lot of people in there then the castle might be a probably one of the better bets besides new zealand chris witt chose 2000 square foot bunker zuckerberg will sell you out don't go there yeah well i mean there's a lot of people who are going to sell you out the hurricanes will take you out in the Car caribbean don't go there i agree not guaranteed, you could probably always find some cave to hide in, but by and large, yeah, if you build something that's going to get torn down by nature. 
Enemy subs will mistake you for the Lusitania. Don't take the yacht. And also in the Caribbean, if you did have some kind of sea level rise at some point, that could be a possibility too. Uh, yeah, you know, in a global combat situation, having a yacht, it could be commandeered by the military or something, or you could just be shot down because they thought you were uh, the enemy, or you, you're probably going to be overrun. Canada, if you're not from there, don't and don't fully understand the environment, you're going to die of exposure. Probably, but even a lot of people who are from Canada, 90% of us are urbanites who are grid dependent. They'll just think because we live in Canada, we have some affinity with the boreal forest and the grasslands and the Rocky Mountains and the shield. Not everybody is adapted to that. In fact, most people, you know, the, the, the extent of what they know about the wilderness is going to some roadside attraction national park for the weekend in their massive RV. So don't be fooled. We're not all that hardcore. There are some of us who are, especially up north. A lot of the uh, Aboriginal people still live that way, or at least the closest you could possibly live to that way. But, and I'm not talking like they live in the wilderness, but they just, they have a hunting, trapping, gathering type lifestyle still, even though they're heavily dependent on the grid, just like everybody else. I'm taking the bunker in the desert. No one is going to blow me up because it's already a crap hole. Nobody cares about it. I'll live for three years and hopefully by then it'll be winter so I don't die of heat exhaustion. Absolutely. That's my biggest concern with the desert is a lack of water. And maybe I've just watched too many Mad Max movies, but I, I can't see it being a, a pleasurable place to be in the post-apocalyptic world of things. But the appeal of having three years worth of supplies and probably those good old tasty MSGs and those preservatives that we're used to. Damn it, MSG is bad for you, but it sure as hell tastes good, doesn't it? I'm not really too concerned with organic when it comes down to a survival situation. I mean, I'm going to eat what's there to be eaten. But, you know, you got these places like Thrive Foods promoting this non-GMO thing, and that's all good. But when it comes to actual survival, do you really care what you're going to eat? You know, unless you're, as long as you're not eating people and soiling green... Uh, if you ask me, you're all right. But hey, you know what? It's cool that people are going that route because ultimately sustainability is going to require or we're just going to have to go full on in the direction of artificial intelligence and mass agriculture to a point where we totally redesigning the genetics of crops. And if we make one mistake with that whatsoever, we're we're done. So if we do go that route, we got to dial it in. Sorry, I keep digressing. Uh, Self-sufficient island, it's all about practicality. Yes, it's practical to live in a self-sufficient island, but it's going to be a lot of work. And a lot of people, I don't know if you know much about living on an island. I'm assuming, you know, you'd have to learn, obviously. But it's going to be primitive, hard work, as I responded here. I'm just trying to play the devil's advocate to all these things. Wolf Walker says, a 2,000 square foot bunker because I live just outside of Arizona now. I'm already a desert rat and I know what to do and what not to do. You know, this is an important point that you're going to fare best at the, sit at the climate that you're most adapted to. So take, for example, Darwin's finches on the archipelago experiment that he did where he observed uh, different birds or finches that had different features in different parts of the island, depending on the habitat, they that would dictate the physical features. So some of the birds had big beaks because the seeds were bigger in one part of the island. Some had smaller feathers because they didn't need to fly as much. Uh, some had uh, more webbed feet so that they could dip into the ocean periodically. I'm just making that up. I don't know what the exact features were, but you get the point. So certain people like a Inuit person is more adapted physically to live in the Arctic they're more physically adapted they have more brown fat uh, which is uh, uh, energy source which allows you to stay warm longer they have different fatty tissues uh, throughout different parts of their body to stay warm and they can physically endure colder temperatures than a person from sub-saharan Africa at the same token uh, they would not fare well in a sub-Saharan African environment or in a very hot environment. So physically, we're all adapted to live and thrive in certain places. Now that said, if you are a person of partial African descent like myself, who is uh, grown up in a northern climate, then that microevolution 
And that ability to micro adapt to your surroundings, that means within your lifetime, not over the course of thousands of years that different peoples have evolved to different places, then that's also going to override some of that genetic uh, advantage for a particular region. But what I'm trying to say is that most of us have gotten used to living in a certain environment. So that's the environment you should probably try to thrive in. Find an environment that really suits you, one that you don't have to struggle in much and uh, stay there. That's where you want to stay. World War III, like big ass bombs and horrible attacks, will all choose to be underground. Sure, hey, you'll probably survive. But, you know, you're going to be right in the Arizona desert, so you better have really good air filtration because you're going to be right in the thick of things. There's going to be bombs going off, you know, on the west coast, on the east coast, and all of that good old radiation and all those nuclear plants going down are going to make uh, life very, very gamma-based. A castle in the woods because I'm originally from Alaska, so you're well adapted to that region, I guarantee. So this is Miss Got a Need to Know says, 2,000 square foot bunker because though living on an island or New Zealand would be my dream as would be living in a castle in Canada, I'm from northern Minnesota, I know how to keep warm, hunt and survive if I have to. They are all too vulnerable in a war of that magnitude for many reasons. Radiation attack, hurricane tsunamis. And being in the Atlantic has the same issues. Plus, any large storm would sink your, your yacht. That's a very good point. A very likely scenario, she says. Unfortunately, the best choice is the least appealing. Underground, hopefully safe from intruders, radiation, storms, weather. With three years of everything you'd need. With luck, after three years, things would be better. Regardless... I use that time uh, to educate myself, or I should say they could be quite worse, actually. You don't know what you're going to be emerging to after three years. For all you know, it could be just bands of deformed, mutated cannibals. Regardless, I'd use that time to educate myself on all things I'd likely possibly face once on up top and how to handle them. Just seems the most logical choice, though not the most luxurious. We're supposed to be using common sense, not chasing our dreams at this point, right? Well, she makes some very valid points. Thank you for a great comment. A castle in the woods that's spacious, secure. The boreal forest is pretty remote. I would be very safe. Plus, I'd have a castle. Okay. All right, so this fellow leaves a really long comment. I'm not sure how much I'm going to read with it. We'll see how good it is. I take the yacht for the mobility side of it. Fishing for food, power generated on board. You could sail the high seas away from coastal conflict and pirates. Most likely, sea won't be as much of a, world, a theater in uh, World War Three as it would probably be happening by air, ICBM, etc., but, you know, there's probably going to be a lot of submarines out there. That's, that may be where, you know, a lot of the powers that be retreat to. Some of these large-scale uh, nuclear-powered submarines. Anyways, except where strategic resources are, I don't see much use of traditional navy, commercial blockades, etc. So this guy's all for the yacht. He makes some uh, compelling points. Some more people commenting on the yacht. The amount of people that chose the, the yacht, which was the most least popular, they sure like to comment. I would feel by far more safe on a solar powered yacht. At that point, all I need to provide myself with is adequate food and medical supplies, as well as basic necessities. Well, that's quite a bit of stuff, you know. So you're probably going to be uh, docking that yacht and you're going to need a little dinghy to go on shore and hope that pirates don't raid your yacht while you are on shore scavenging for supplies. Anyways, a 2,000 square foot bunker because all the other options have great risks. Me personally, I have no idea what I'm doing on the boat. The isolation weather in the boreal forest are problems. I agree. Isolationalism should not be understated. Talking to yourself or talking to a volleyball like uh, what's his face on the movie castaway is not going to be a good thing necessarily if there's nobody around you're going to make people and they're going to be in your own head that's not just something you see in the movies that's reality three years of supplies is a lot and i'm assuming that means three years of everything you would need indeed that was the deal you get three years worth of everything i'd be able to scavenge for more and in the Arizona desert, you're not too far from places in which you could scavenge or utilize. I don't think scavenging is going to be a very realistic thing to do in Arizona, especially considering you have some big cities in there like Phoenix, where people are going to be basically uh, migrating outwards afterwards because there's not going to be any other options. Everything's going to be 
consumed very quickly after any sort of disaster. So there's not going to be much to scavenge. It's going to be picked through and picked through and picked through. And basically, what you're probably going to find is uh, a bullet from somebody who wants to take your stuff. Here's another one for the yacht. And the reason why I'm giving the yacht so much attention, I'm trying to give attention to the choices which aren't very popular. Because we all know why you should choose an island or a castle. I mean, those ones, uh, the, the pros of those are pretty obvious. But the yacht is probably the best choice as it is the only one that allows you free movement. I served in the Navy in the Atlantic. Okay, so there's his bias. So he has a familiarity with the sea. So a person like him, I would say, is more well adapted to this choice than somebody else. And this is how people are choosing, it seems, on the basis of their own experience, which makes sense and not just in general terms because a lot of these choices really do come down to what you know if you're a person who grew up in the caribbean obviously you're probably going to choose the caribbean because that's what you know it's what you're familiar with once you get past the equator the chances of a navy being around is also slim as you have to avoid two coastlines plenty of islands to seek shelter at and either make a permanent base or just stay for a while while moving around that's a good point so you're gonna have to find an island the only problem would be disguising your yacht hopefully it's more of a camouflage yacht that could be seen from too far away uh, if there was a boat passing by uh this guy picked a castle in the woods i just picked what i know and i'm comfortable with there you go what else do we got here? I mean, lonely in a small, uh, isolated island in the Caribbean, but I'm living on a paradise island till nuclear winter. For the Canadian castle thing, you would die from the weather from nuclear winter. Well, that nuclear winter thing is debatable. I've heard uh, mixed opinions on that. In fact, I think the idea has been somewhat debunked. Go ahead and research nuclear winter. Yacht, obviously, for mobility. Second is the bunker, not for bugging in, but let me explain the bigger picture first okay uh, I miss the raw instinct to go forward to build when everything falls apart to gain strength when everybody gets weak you guys prepare for the collapse you think about every its aspect but plan to just play dead when it happens instead of thriving in undisputably your environment keeping low profile instead of rising when the system falls checking your six instead of taking down whatever is on 12 that's very poetic of you so I think I, I get where this guy is going. I hate isolationist things. Pretty safe early, yes, but high risk, no reward in the long run. That's powerful stuff. You can build an empire if you're not afraid, the hustle, and you have a plan. High risk, forward thinking, hard work, and willingness to action offers ultimate rewards. You know, I like this guy. What's his name? Holy shit, this is a long comment. Wow. I don't think I'm going to be able to read this all, but this is a very good comment. Fake you, Fake unicorn. CP, please keep up the good work. Blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much, sir. Keep up the good comments. This comment is awesome. Let's do one more uh, probe into your comment here. I can also find a big island with my yacht, preferably in the Pacific. Build a bunker here and small lookout tower and do some farming here. Why not? It would be a nice retirement. Blah, blah, blah. I also like Vikings. Okay. I have unlimited power for my gadgets. That's one of the benefits from the start. Um, I have a lot of room for logistics operations. I can choose my base wherever I want. I can use it to trade, indeed. Maybe I can sell the waste salt from desalination. Salt will be a trade article in the island. Absolutely. Cons, I have to navigate it precisely. Here comes the problem as I've never ever seen the sea. <laughs> Penetrated hull can very well result in dead people. Me. People will recognize me from afar. Well, you know, it, the, the sea is a pretty big place, and there's a lot of mirages from what I hear, but uh, they might, especially if it's not cloaked well. Knowing when to be and where to be is crucial. Hurricanes, mad main dangers, etc. Finally, on the long run, I will need some serious techno skills to be able to repair it and keep it running. Very good comment. I would say the island, but natural disasters would be a bigger threat than... Anything people could do. Canadian borough forest for me. Me too, by default. I get it. Hurricanes are harsh, but life is about quality, my man. It's a good point. It's a good point. And you could just keep rebuilding, I guess. Keep rebuilding the same old grass hut or whatever you're going to build to live in down there over and over again. You're probably going to need to build one every season anyways. Castle in the woods because you'll be able to remain low-key while having the fortification for self-defense. Get your 
itself a small group and arms and you should be able to ride things out without a major event a small island can be invaded by a foreign force patrolling the seas you know i really like what the unicorn guy said about the isolationist versus a nomadic expansive mindset i'm sure i've made a video or i've commented on that at some point in the past i've made so many videos now about this topic my main man michael loberg says i love the caribbean and would love gardening and fishing there as a lifestyle for the rest of my time here you know it probably would be a good place to just live out the rest of your life i agree canada is great but the cold would kill me literally pirates would take a boat sooner or later 50 or no 50. i won't pick a bunker while i can have an island not going out living in a hole NZ, NZ ranks high but doesn't beat an island. P.S. The island comes with rum, right? It can't be that there isn't any rum there. Arr. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I'm sure you can make rum. You can find a way to to uh, make some rum down there. You'd have a lot of time to figure it out. Stay tuned for these polls. I'm going to keep doing them. And I really enjoy this because it, it gives me a lot to just think about. Oftentimes when I do these polls, the result that I think that is going to be the number one isn't and in this case it actually was i figured people would probably pick the island but there's a part of me for practical long-term survivability in the lazy part of me that doesn't want to be expansive and want to go out and try to conquer the world that bunker is appealing three years worth of supplies the all-american prepper in me that just wants to sit there and get exercise cleaning my guns because remember guns are fitness there's a part of me that wants to ride it out but you know there's a part of me that each one of those environments i would consider probably would settle on the canadian boreal forest because hey that's where i am that's what i know thanks for watching guys i should also add uh, one other thing that we're going to be carrying at the store soon is this counter assault bear deterrent 1.84 percent capsaicin uh, very powerful stuff a great bear deterrent this of course is a prohibited weapon to be used on humans so you do not want to use this on human beings you will be uh, prosecuted in a court of law in canada for doing so but it is great for uh, deterring bear attacks even if just for peace of mind i'm pretty sure i'm gonna run into some problems if i try to ship this across the border so i may not be able to offer this product to my american friends and i think if you're a canadian citizen and you buy this you may have to fill out a form i don't really know all the, the specifics yet but it's going to be on sale pretty soon always good to have some of this stuff and then a crap hits the fan scenario if there was a breakdown of rule of law well all those laws go out the window i guess but you know those laws may come back too so it's all on you it's a it's all about personal responsibility and i will not be held accountable for your misuse of something of this nature very powerful stuff anyways guys uh check it out thanks for watching don't forget to like comment subscribe stay tuned for more we got the emp video coming out in t minus 10 days thanks for watching canadian prepper out